Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us this evening. Uh, this is John McDougall. I am the event coordinator here at Murder by the Book in Houston. And before we get started and bring out Hallie and Susanna, I just want to make a couple of quick announcements to let everybody know what has been going on at the store lately, if you haven't tuned into one of our events. Uh, first up, we are open for browsing. If you haven't come to see us in a while, please come in. We are uh, asking that you mask up when you come in. Um, if you were not getting out and about and still prefer curbside pickup, you can always do that. Uh, just give us a call when you pull into the parking lot. We're always happy to run books out to the car for you. Uh, we are also still offering uh, free media mail shipping on, on orders over $75. You don't need a code for that if your order um, qualifies when you place an order on the website. That shipping option will pop up. I've got a nice full roster of stuff coming up. Um, we have, I think, something almost every night for the rest of um, October. We're going to be chatting with uh, Val McDermott in conversation with Patricia, Patricia Cornwell uh, next Tuesday at one o'clock. Uh, next Tuesday night, we're going to be hosting an event for the Best American Mystery and Suspense uh, collection that's coming out. That's going to be moderated by Alifair Burke and Steph Cha. We're super excited about that, um, and we hope that you guys will tune in for that. I also wanted to mention on Thursday, the 21st, we're going to be hosting the first of our Crime Writers of Color um, reading series. We're going to be doing something with them every other month, and their first theme is going to be... Uh, um, Edge of Your Seat Thrillers, it's going to be hosted by Kelly Garrett and Alex Segura, and they've got a really great lineup for there, too, so I hope that you will tune in for that. Um, as always, you can check out the full roster of events at murderbooks.com. If you've missed any of them, they're always available on the store's YouTube channel and our Facebook pages, so if you've missed one, you can um, go back through there. Also wanted to mention tonight, if you have not ordered copies of Susanna's book yet, we do have the Indie, book score, indie Bookstore exclusive hardcover. Um, they are signed. They have this really cool map that has um, kind of special locations in the, in the book um, pointed out, and as you can see, they are signed by Susanna. And we also have signed book plates to go with them too. So um, once we get started, I will drop a link in the comments if you wanna uh, order copies. And also while Susanna and Hallie are speaking this evening, if you have questions for either one of them, whether it's about their new books, previous books, writing process, any of that, please post those in the live uh, chat on YouTube or uh, in the comments on Facebook. And we will get to those in just a little bit. But, but for now, we're gonna. I'm going to get us started. First, I'm going to bring out Susanna. How are you tonight, Susanna? I'm well, thank you, Johnny. How are you? I'm good. It's good to see you. It's great to see you. It has been way too long. Yeah. So uh, for those of you watching, we got to chat with Susanna uh, last year when the um, short story collection came out that I'm completely blanking on the title of right now. Uh, the Deadly um, Hours. Yeah, The Deadly Hours. So we got to chat with her and uh, Annalie Huber and Christina Trent and um, C.S. Harris. Harris. Yeah, which was really great. So if you missed that, I'll, I'll, um, I'll find the link and I'll drop that in the comments yeah. too if anybody wants to check that out. But I'm so excited that we actually could talk to you about a full length novel uh, this evening. I'm sorry mm -hmm. we can't do it in person, but getting to at least do it virtually is, is good too. I miss the barbecue though. Yeah, definitely. The barbecue that comes after the live event. So, yeah. uh, when we did our, in November, we, no, it was March. I have no idea what time it is. In March, we did an event with uh, Deanna Rayburn and Lauren Willig and Tasha Alexander. And we always would have barbecue with Deanna afterwards too. And I told her that I was half tempted to have um, it delivered to the house. And she was like, if you do an event with me and you have barbecue afterwards and I find out about it, I will murder you. You cannot have barbecue tonight. And I was like, okay, no, I won't. And she probably would too. She I definitely would. would. Yeah. You're, yeah. You're, very few people that I would take that threat seriously from, but Deanna is definitely one. So uh, congratulations on the release of The Vanished Days. Thank you. So I'm going to bring out Hallie now. How are you tonight, Hallie? I'm very good. It's delightful to be here. Thanks so much for joining us. <laughs> uh, so Hallie's most recent book um, was Careful What You Wish For, which came out uh, in August of 2020. I'm going to get them officially introduced and read their bios before I get us started. Uh, so as we mentioned, uh, Susanna's book, The Managed Days, just came out on Tuesday. Uh, so New York Times, USA Today, and Globe and Mail bestselling author Susanna Kearsley is a former museum creator, curator, I can't read tonight, former museum curator who loves restoring the lost voices of real people to the page, often in twin-stranded stories that interweave present and past. Her award-winning novels have been published in translation in more than 25 countries, and she lives near Toronto. 
As we mentioned, Hallie's most recent release is Careful What You Wish For. Um, and Hallie Efron is the New York Times bestselling author of Never Tell a Lie. Come and find me. There was an old woman and night sleep, I'm sorry, night, night, sleep tight. Uh, for 12 years, she was the crime fiction reviewer for the Boston Globe, the daughter of Hollywood screenwriters. Uh, she grew up in Beverly Hills and lives near Boston, Massachusetts. So as I mentioned, if you guys have questions, Stein, as you're watching out there for Hallie or Susanna, please post those and we will get to them in a little bit. But for now, I'm going to turn the chat over to y'all and I will see you in just a little bit. Okay. See ya. Okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kick things off okay. by saying... I love this book, first of all. It is wonderful. This is a, an advanced reader's copy, so it does not have that map, and so I'm going to have to get myself a copy because <laughs> that map looks uh, pretty cool. Uh, it's a wonderful book. It's just rich and engrossing and everything that you expect from one of Susanna's books. So I thank her for inviting me to do this. Um, what I especially love about it is it's a bit of a mystery. And I write mysteries. And so I wanted to ask Susanna, um, if you, if she knew she was, if, if this felt different in any way from the, the books that, uh, for instance, the trilogy that it's the third book in, you know, because it is so pronouncedly a mystery. Did you think about it any differently as you were working on it? I didn't really think about it any differently because each book sort of takes its own shape you know you, you know yourself how each book right um kind of decides what it's going to do and and um you know i i i'm a pantser i'm not a plotter i i kind of just throw the characters on there and, and see where they're going to go um i start with a very um a very detailed timeline for the historical part of the book so i know the historical timeline i'm working within but I never know where the characters are going to be moving within that timeline. What did feel different with this book, oh, there were a couple of things. Um, although I work with dual timelines, usually it's a modern day and then a historical timeline interwoven. In this one, there were two historical timelines interwoven. So that was different. Um, and usually I'm working with a first person uh, narrator who's a woman. And in this one, the first sentence I got was in my mind was obviously spoken by a man. So that was scary and new and something I'd never really attempted before. Um, so that was different. And then I, I could tell that it was, it was heavier on the suspense and the mystery than some of my other books, but each book is different. So it, it, all my books have a, have a blend of things. They have mystery, history, romance, some of them have a light paranormal mix in there and the it's like it's like making cakes and you're never quite sure how much of each ingredient is going to going to um come out topmost in in the blend and in this one it's just the the mystery is is definitely up there at the top um but that's happened before in a couple of my books where the mystery would sort of be the the foremost um ingredient and and i think you know as i got into the book i could see that it was really taking you know taking center stage so i just went with it i just let them go um yeah and and it's fun for me too because it's a mystery for me too i never always know who's who's doing it or who the bad guy is or what, how it's going to turn out so this is part of a trilogy but it's a prequel it's so not even just it's, talk it's, about that the three books and how they it's well it's not even really a planned like I, I wish I planned things like that because I don't really I like so many of my books are all interconnected because the characters just keep wandering around um so the the publisher I think I have this feeling of my poor publisher just running around behind me trying to create a series out of this mess that I am creating trying to say okay well how can we possibly gather up all these books and put them into some kind of shape um but really what happens is the readers once the book's leave me and, and become the property of the readers. The readers try to create order out of it. And over on Goodreads, what the readers ended up doing was they took uh, previous books of mine, um, The Winter Sea and The Firebird, which are linked, they're historical stories 
are linked. The, the Firebird continues the historical story from the Winter Sea. And the readers said, aha, well, that makes a, a little tiny series. So we'll create a series out of that. We'll give it a name. It's the Slains series, because Slains is the name of the castle that features in both of them. And they popped that up on, on Goodreads. But that was a reader-created phenomenon. And because some of the same characters feature in this one, I'm sure that over on Goodreads, this is now Slain's number three, probably, only because it's the third in the order that I've written them, but it's actually, time-wise, it comes before the other two, chronologically, you know, in, in terms of the action. So my publisher, in trying to make sense of <laughs> Of the source books and trying to make sense of what I'm doing has decided, okay, they're all Scottish. So we'll call it the Scottish series. And that way, you know, everything will sort of make sense that way. So I think it's Scottish number, Scottish series number three, because it's the third one they've published into that world. But really, I kind of take, I guess if you take the winter sea as the fixed point in that world, uh, the Winter Sea being the first Jacobite book that I wrote, the first book that dealt with Jacobite, uh, the Jacobite invasion attempt that happened in 1708. Um, the Firebird sort of continued the action of that. This book has some overlapping action with the Winter Sea. Some of it takes place in 1707 in the build up to that invasion attempt. It contains some of the same characters. We meet some of those characters when they're younger. Some of the action goes way back to the beginning of the Jacobite movement. So it's it's a sort of prequel, sort of companion book. It's all very, you know, messy. Um, so it's, it yes, they are kind of a series. They're all kind of linked in that way. But it's not as if you have to begin right. here and read all the way through. Right. No, I don't, I don't like doing that. To yeah, I don't like I don't like saying to readers you have to start right. at point A and read because you for one thing, you know, I've been in the business for what 26, 27 years now and and you never know if your books are going to be in print that long. You can't do that because right. you you might not have a book in print. Right, right. Um one of the, one things, of the things that I, I found, found so, so fascinating, fascinating in this book this was, was the Darien scheme. And I don't know bookas about Scottish history. So for me, this was eye-opening that it was, well, first of all, it's a real turning point in history that I did not know. And it's the turning point in your novel too. Right. So can you talk about that, the way that those two, the well, the, Darien, there? the Darien scheme, I'm, I'm going to try not, I'm going to try to keep it. I'm, I'm very chatty. So I'll try to keep it short. The Darien scheme was Scotland's attempt to found a colony of its own in what is now Panama, where the Panama Canal, roughly where the Panama Canal now goes through. Um, and it was a colony with a purpose. What they were doing, what they were trying to do, they formed their own. This was the age when everybody was doing the East India companies, uh, the, the great trading companies. And Scotland being a, you know, a great trading, you know, like outward looking nation, what they wanted to do was, was actually quite brilliant. They wanted to carry cargoes down on the Atlantic side um, to their colony that they were going to found. And then they were going to unload the cargoes, carry them across this little isthmus of land and uh, load them back onto ships on the Pacific side. And by doing that, they would cut out the, the trade of all the, of the British East India Company, the Dutch East India Company, and all the other ones that had to go down around the various capes. Right. in order to to do their trading um brilliant idea brilliant plan they had everything um all in place they had a charter from king william who allowed them to you know to start the venture but then he immediately behind their backs undercut everything that they were planning on doing because king william was dutch and was you know under pressure from um both spain who, although they didn't have a claim to this particular piece of land, were pressuring him. Um, and also the, the uh, East India Company, which didn't want any kind of competition whatsoever. So unbeknownst to the Scottish um, settlers who were, who were 
sailing down there. King William did, uh, he sent um, proclamations down to all the English colonies along the way that they were expecting, that the Scots were expecting to trade with in order to get their provisions on their way down to their colony. King William sent proclamations down forbidding them to trade with the Scots on their way down. So this would be like New York, Jamaica, everywhere that they could have stopped in to provision, to get water, to get anything on their way down. So they had taken all these supplies to trade. They'd taken wigs, they'd taken clothing, they'd taken everything to trade. And everywhere that they put in, they were they got no help whatsoever. Um, so that was their first disappointment. And, and when they were finally shown one of these proclamations, they wouldn't. They couldn't believe it that their king would stab them in the back like that. Um, and then when they got down to to Darien, um, you know, there was infighting between the the colonists because the the company had you know had chosen some you know not very good mixes of people. But also when the Spaniards did start um, harassing them, King William just looked the other way. Whereas with Jamaica, if the Spaniards harassed Jamaica, he would send the entire fleet down to protect them. With Darien, he was just kind of like, oh, no, sorry, you're completely on your own. So it, it, they had, it, it was just a, a complete horrible, horrible situation. Um, and the result of it being that it bankrupted Scotland because the other thing King William had done was, was make it impossible. He prevented the English or the Dutch from investing in the company, even though both had been initially quite keen to do so. All the investors had pulled out except the Scots. So the Scots had invested heavily in the company. They lost their money. They were bankrupted. And that was one of the primary reasons why the union between Scotland and England came about, because Scotland was bankrupted by the, the Daring Venture. Wow. So you know, it's one of those, I read a wonderful line in, in the book that, that led me to write The Winter Sea um, that was attributed to Lord Dacre. And, it, and he said that history is not the story of what happened. It is the story of what happened in the context of what might have happened. And I always wonder what might have happened if the Scots had been allowed to found that colony, Darien. And, you know, if they had been supported by their king instead of undermined by their king. And, you know, what a different world you could have right now with, with that successful. One of the One things of the that things I love about, about this book is, is that you have this, have this huge, huge story. story. It's a it's historical a story. event. It changed the course of history. But the dynamics of it are echoed in the individual, in the characters. So you have a romance, you have romance, you have mystery, but they're echoing this these bigger, much bigger themes on a smaller canvas. Mm. I'm sure that was deliberate, right? Sometimes, <laughs> yes, <laughs> sure, yes, yes, yeah. it was totally planned. No, uh, sometimes um, I think all of I think a lot of what happens has its, you know, can be examined and echoed in in individual. Um, interactions, but sometimes it just happens, you know, sometimes the theme just, sometimes I don't know what the theme is. Until you write. Until you write it and you look at it. Do you find that with your books? Do you well, find it, you know, yeah. do you find that? Like that you Absolutely just sort of. I do. Yeah. I always say themes, I mean, people, well, and sometimes you'll be at a book event and someone will say, oh, I just love the theme of your book. And they'll go on and on about the theme of your book. And then you'll go, yeah, okay. <laughs> and, then you, and then you make notes about it so that you can remember. Yeah. yeah, because I do think themes crawl out of books sometimes. Otherwise, it feels kind of heavy handed, you know, and that's yeah. not something you want the reader to experience is, oh, this is about, you yeah. know, betrayal. This is about, you know, you want, you want to make it a little bit um, meaty, I guess, is the word. Um, you know what I find sometimes? I find it often it's something a character says. Mm. Um, because for me, like, and every writer's different, but for me, I hear them talking in my head. And so I'll hear these conversations going on between the characters. And, and sometimes it'll be towards the end of a book and a character will say something. And I'll think, 
That's it. That's what the whole thing's about. That's what, that's why the, you know, the title means this or the title means that. Like for the, for the Vanished Days, for example, I mean, I chose the title of the book because I love that John Maysfield poem. I just love that John Maysfield poem. So it just, it, that's it in the beginning of the book. And it just seemed to fit the, the style of the, of what I wanted to say. But later in the book, one of the characters talks about the Vanished Days and says, makes a comment about them. And I thought that's, that's what the whole thing is about. That's what, you know, that's what it's trying to say. And, and so that gave an extra resonance to the title that I hadn't really intended it to have, you know, and it, it um, sometimes your subconscious is a whole lot smarter than, than you are, you know, did you yeah. ever, did you ever get like way into a book and have no idea what, you know, what the whole meaning of um, it was or. No, <laughs> only, my un, only my unpublished books. I mean, I do think, um, you know, one of the things uh, I do a lot of teaching of, of uh, mm. people who are working on manuscripts and haven't yet published. And, and I do find that the number one problem when you're trying to write a novel for, you know, not for everyone, but it is you start writing a story and you just keep saying this happened and then this happened and then this happened. And then you think, so what? Right. Yeah. There's no arc. There's no. And and what your book has is fantastic. You know, there's two main characters that, that you're going to be that are your, your your guardrails through it, you know, and you go back and forth um, and it's their stories. Their change, their experiences that provide kind of the, the don't you think the backbone for the novel? Yeah. Yeah. I always think, I always think it's, I always think when you're, when I'm doing any of my novels, it's always that main couple um, that, and that's why I think it, it's, you know, no matter what else is going on in my book, it's the main couple, the, the romantic interaction between the main couple that, that forms the, the spine really that, you know, if you take that spine out, you almost have no story. You can right. have, there's a lot of other thing that, things that layer onto it. And, um, you know, the, the historical parts and the mystery and the everything else. But, you know, you can have a very compelling mystery. But if you don't have characters that people care about. Exactly. It's, it's not, it's just, a, it's, it's just, a, it's just dead to me. Like, you don't remember it and you don't, you know, why keep reading if you don't care I was about say, Those are the books that you, you put know. down in the middle and yeah. you never pick up again. Yeah. Yeah. But that's what I find for a lot of writers is they haven't. They haven't got the character arc. That's what I call it anyway, is is they haven't figured out what what is they they know the act one, act two, act three. They know the turning points. They know all the plot things, but they don't know the character stuff. The, the, I, the character is just I, hanging on plot and, and it should be the other way around. Whereas I don't I don't do act one, <laughs> act one, act two, act, act, one, act, two, act three. So I'm really bad. I, but But then again, it's good for people that are you know, they may be listening to us too, because there's, you know, there's no wrong way, you know, it, it's, it's. Oh, there are lots of wrong ways. There no, are no, but lots I mean, lots. <laughs> no, but I mean, what I mean to say is yeah. people can, people can plot, like it's not wrong to plot with the acts and the, and, yeah. and working out where your turning point is going to go and working out where your dark moment's going to be and your denouement and stuff like, you know, because some, for some people that is a completely necessary part of the process and, and you right. can produce beautiful, beautiful, memorable, compelling books. It is not, you know, because some people get very um, pretentious with the, you can, you can get pantsers that get very pretentious and say, oh, well, you know, my my characters just write the story and you know you can't they take you can't. over yeah, yeah I, I, well, I want and, to invite them to my house come on over <laughs> well and mine do I mean like but 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 that doesn't mean that people who plot are you know it, it doesn't mean that my way is superior right. to somebody who plots it's just different my brain doesn't doesn't work that way but somebody else's does and you end up at the same place you end up with a story and you know, it's my brain. All that's happening is my subconscious is doing that right. without me being aware of it doing that. My subconscious is still putting those points in 
you know, it's still putting the black moment in, it's still putting, it's still kind of roughly dividing things into scenes. I'm sure that if you were to analyze that book, you could probably divide it into, you know, Absolutely. the scenes and everything. It's just, I've been writing so long that my brain is doing that without me being aware of me doing that. Can you go back? How many books is it now, Susanna? Oh, I think it's, I think I'm on my 15th. I okay. think I'm starting my 15th. Can you go back to when you were writing that first book? Yep. And, and, and hacking your way through yep. what's different? <laughs> no terror. <laughs> well, actually, no, I can't, I can't say no, no, I can't, I can't say that because I'm still terrified every time I start. I'm terrified every time I start. Yeah, but I, I am too. Yeah, I am too. I'm, I'm terrified because I, I face it and it, and it's still that black, that big black road with no headlights that I don't know where I'm going. And I've never been here before and it's new and, and I get in the middle and it's just, um, it's completely foreign territory and I don't know where I'm going. And it, it just, I just get panicky and it doesn't look like where I'm supposed to be. And I just want to dump it all. But the, but at the same time, there's that joy of setting out on a new journey. Like, you know, that excitement of starting, you know, where you're packing your suitcases and you're getting all excited and you're going on a new trip. Like I still have that because I'm starting, you know, a brand new book and mm -hmm. And I still have that kind of excitement right now because I'm meeting new characters, I'm meeting new people, I'm starting a whole new thing that I haven't wrecked yet. I haven't ruined it yet. By the time I get to the middle of it, I'm going to be like, oh, man, yeah. this, somebody else should have written this book because it would have been so good if they'd written it. But I'm wrecking I it. I do find, you know, I'll say to myself, oh, I know I've been lost here before. And that helps a little bit. Yeah. How do you feel about writing the ending? Does, does it, once you get there and you see it, does it just become a, a slide right to the end? It becomes like, a, a Diana and I were talking, but Diana Gabaldon and I were talking about this on Monday. It's like a puzzle. It's like, when, you know, when, you, you know when you, you, you've got the edges of the puzzle and then you started piecing it in from the outside, right? And as you get towards the middle, there are fewer and fewer pieces that you have to worry about fitting in. And as you get towards the ending, it goes faster and faster because those like, you know, you know where the pieces are going and you can look at them and you go, oh, that one goes there and this one goes here and this one goes here and this, and it goes faster and faster. And by the end of it, everything is just dropping into place. And I love that. Feeling. I yeah. love the feeling when you get towards the end and it's like, oh, this goes here and this goes here. And I know where this one goes and I know where this one goes. And it's, I don't want to leave the writing room at that point. Yeah. I, I literally don't want to leave the writing room. And it can be really upsetting for my family because they have to eat whatever is available. And I'm just in here just going crazy. <laughs> and it's because everything is just, I, I'm learning all these things that I didn't know about the story. So, so I find I, when I write a novel, very often I will I have an opening, an opening, Yep. maybe a line, a paragraph, a chapter, which then at the end is becomes like a bookend. Right. Like if you go back to that opening, even though I was lost in the middle, the ending kind of matches that opening in a weird way. Do you, do you do that as well? Do you have Yeah, that? I find it comes to like in a circle. And do you do that? Do you find, is that just organic? Does that just happen? No, I just think it's luck, but uh, <laughs> What I, I mean, your opening, I, I wrote it down. I was a younger man when I first met her. Yep. It's a lovely opening line. Okay. Um, and it goes on through a paragraph. And at the end, it says, uh, I knew I was in trouble. Yep. Which is so cool because you want to know, whoa, what kind of trouble oh. was he in? And, and foreshadowing. Was, and yeah. Oh. So did you do that in this book? Do you feel like, you know, when you get to the end, you can go back to that beginning and. Well, I gotta, I've got to follow through on that. Like yeah. if I, you know, like if you foreshadow, you got to follow through, right? Did you, you write can't. that first before you wrote the middle and the end, or did yeah. you? That I get the first. I got that first line first. When I get the first line, I know I've got a novel to write. Mm -hmm. um, but my first line is not always the first line in the book. Um, sometimes it's like you know how sometimes the first line you write down on the page isn't always the first line it doesn't always end up being the first line sometimes right it's, right sometimes it's like 
the first line of the second chapter, or sometimes it's buried, or sometimes it doesn't even end up in the book at all. But usually, usually the first line is the first line. And that's how I knew I had a male first narrator, because I'm like, you know, heck, <laughs> what do you mean you were the, you know, you were a younger man, you're supposed to be a woman, you're supposed to be like, you know, I'm not supposed to be writing men. Um, well, let's so, talk about that, voices, okay? Yeah. Um, half your book is written from a male character's point mm -hmm. of view and half from a woman. Right. And wow, you know, how was that? Tricky. It's tricky. Yeah. It's tricky. But I kind of feel like, like if I look back, I kind of feel like my subconscious knew that was coming too because um, I had a... The novella that I wrote um, that Johnny was talking about in The Deadly Hours was written from the point of view of this really, really quiet character, male character that I had. But it was third person. I was inside his head, but it was third person. So, and I, I, I think I just wrote it because he was so quiet in the main book that he appeared in that I just wanted to get inside his head. And, you know, was kind of revenge because he wouldn't talk to me when I was writing the book book that he was supposed to be in. He would just kind of shrug and walk off the book. And I was like, ah, I can't write that. So I wrote a whole novella from his point of view. It was like, serve you right. And, uh, but I think my brain was actually um, practicing male point of view all the way through that, because I don't know if have you, have you written, do you write? Yeah. So, you know, you know how, when you're writing male point of view, the descriptions are different right? What, what a man sees versus what a woman sees, right? Yeah. I or, once, I once wrote a, a male character looking at a woman coming in the room and describing the suit that she was wearing as aubergine. And my writing group went, <laughs> no, no, no. never use a word like that to describe that color. You'd say so, it was purple, you know, unless he, unless he was a designer. I, I still remember, was, yeah, exactly. I still remember. He no, he wasn't. I, <laughs> my dad, my dad was reading a, a, a mystery writer, not you, but I, and I won't even say who it is, but my dad was reading a, a mystery writer who had described somebody coming in in a, in a silk shantung blouse. And my dad is like, I wouldn't even know what a silk shantung That's blouse was. I don't know what silk shantung is. You know, and it was a male detective who was supposed to be yeah. noticing this. And I said, well, you know, if he was a dressmaker or a designer, he might know, but you're right. Like a guy would just say it's kind of a shiny blouse or a, you know. Right. But so that oh, taught he would, or he would yeah. notice the shape underneath it. I mean, yeah, maybe seriously, yeah. you know, yeah. And my and so when I was writing my novella from the male point of view, like my guy was an assassin. So when he went into a room, he didn't look at the drapes, he didn't look at the flooring, he didn't look at what was on the table. Even he looked at where the doors were, and you know, right. set his set his back to the the wall, and that was it. That's all he really cared about. So it made it really tricky to write the novel um, or the novella because I had to. I'm used to describing everything and I had to try to give you a picture of what was there through this guy's eyes. He really didn't care what was there. Um, so I, you know, with Adam, with the narrator for this one, I kind of struck a balance because at least he noticed some things, but then you have to take away half of what he would ordinarily notice. Um, so it was tricky, but uh, yeah, tricky. And, and secrets, trying to write a mystery trying to put everything out there and be fair with your reader, but not give away anything tricky, which I should have called you. That's what I should have done. When I knew <laughs> I was writing something like this, I should have, I should have gotten in touch with you right away. It would have saved me a lot of whiskey and a lot of headaches right at the beginning. You know, I, I know a lot of uh, people will talk about how do you write a mystery and they talk about clues and red herrings. And I never, ever think about clues or red herrings. I think about secrets, right? And who knows them? And who doesn't? Right. And, and what are the clues? Or I suppose I do think of clues in that sense. Yeah. To to who knows it and what it is. Right. Um, because secrets are character driven. Clues and red herrings are just prop plop, just props. Props. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, I mean, I, your book has a number of secrets in it that I think readers will. I think readers really love it when you you make it work when they when when they get blindsided and realize something that's been right there in front of them the whole time well i love magic right and magic is all misdirection magic is all look over here while i do this over here 
Right. And, and I think that's what I love about writing when people do that, when people do that with writing. And so, you know, I think secrets a lot of the time are that too, but I love that way of looking at it. The who knows, like, you know, bring it down to character instead of, you know, Chekhov's gun, right? It Because because too yeah. often I think people focus on the object and not the person. And if you bring it to the, the personal level, I think that's really good advice. So I'll keep that in mind because the one I'm writing now is, is a mystery yeah. driven one too. So. When, I, when I started writing mysteries, one of the first books I bought was a book by Henning Nelms, who's a uh -huh. uh, magician. And it's called The Art of the Conjurer. And it's all that stuff about why magicians have female assistants wearing the sparkly little little outfits and how you get people to look here while you're doing something there. Um, and it was very useful to, uh, uh, to, to me as a mystery writer to figure out how to put something in plain sight that right. the reader doesn't see. Oh, that's cool. Put it in I'll, have to, I'll have to get that. Who, what well, you do that, that in, in, in okay. this book. No, I know, but I'll have to, I'll have to, yeah. I'll have to, you can always, see, that's the thing about writing too, is that you're always learning and you're, you're not always learning from, people think that you learn a lot of writing craft just from writing books, like from, right. from writing guides and things like that. But a lot of the writer's craft is picked up from other fields as well. Um, Right. You can learn a lot from, you know, magic books and, and art books and, and, you know, people writing about different things that you can incorporate into your own craft, which is, you know, fun. Yeah, which makes me want to ask you about, I mean, one of the things that distinguishes you as a writer is the research that you do, the historical detail, the accuracy. And I know you work really hard at it. And I wondered if you could talk about your prior lives, you know, <laughs> as the daughter of parents who do and genealogy. Your first job yeah. And, uh, yeah. How, how that, all that stuff that was, didn't seem like it went anywhere paid off for you. Well, it does go places. This is my little shirt is going crazy here. Just a second. It's just a, it's like a cardigan on top yeah. of my shirt thing. Um, I am the daughter of genealogy, amateur genealogist. So I was born into a family that did a lot of genealogy. So from the time I was born, we were getting dragged around to archives and, and cemeteries and, you know, copying down inscriptions and, and stuff, which is, which is, I found terribly fun. You know, this, this whole sense of, of your family, not just being your immediate family in your house, but this thing that extends back for generations and centuries and and that played a part in all these different historical episodes throughout time was just you know the, there are people that look down on you from portraits and, and you know really really <laughs> fascinating to me so it's 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 cool um and so that led me to a, a love of you know history and an interest in history because when you have family members that are involved in or you can place a family member within a time period you know like you're learning about the industrial revolution and you think okay well that's when my dad's ancestors were moving from um you know north yorkshire into lancashire to follow the the work of this of the the silk weaving trade or, or something to to go work in the mills or to go work in the mines or or that sort of thing, and, and it makes it more real for you. Um, that fed my love of history, which later on got me into, you know, museum jobs and museum work and, and that sort of thing. And museum work teaches you the teaches you a few things. Um, I always I already knew how to research from genealogy because genealogy is very meticulous. Um, you don't just sort of grab the first person with the, the right surname. You have to you have to reference and cross reference and make sure it's the right person. Um, and you spend a lot of hours in dusty rooms going through, you know, dusty <laughs> dusty records. Um, you should did back then because there was no internet back then. 
but museum work teaches you the importance of curation and the role that curation has played over over time in creating a story of the past and what voices get left out of that and what objects get left out of that and how some things get left in the storeroom and how some things get put out on the front shelves and um that is a very useful thing for a historical novelist or somebody who deals with historical stories to learn because then you go looking for if you're like me you go looking for those voices that got left out you want to learn about the stories that got left out um and the other thing that that i found really useful was i i studied politics at university um and i had a fabulous political professor who whenever we were learning something would um bring in books by everybody about it. So if we were learning about the Cuban Missile Crisis, he would bring in books uh, by, you know, like a Russian book and a, um, an American book, a Canadian book, a British book, a Japanese book, like everything. So we weren't just learning one perspective, we were learning everybody's perspective on it. And he would throw them all in, you know, we, we, our class was held in the pub, which was but you know he would he would say like somewhere in the middle of that if you read all that somewhere in the middle of that is what actually happened and that was a very very good lesson to learn the course was some political inquiry and analysis which is the best thing you can learn um so with all that wrapped up in me when i go out to do my research i don't just look for one thing when i'm trying to do the history of the jacobites i look for everybody's voice and I look for the voices that the historians didn't think were important enough to preserve um and I just keep rootling around until I find them and I spend a lot of great hours in in archives getting to know some people that uh historians didn't think were important enough to preserve and um I get attached to them that's my problem is I get attached to these people and then when I get attached to them I get very protective of them. And when I get protective of them, I, I want to put them back on the page in a way that does justice to them. And uh, I feel like I'm kind of the caretaker of, of their voice and their life. And, um, and then I kind of wrap them in fictional characters that I think will, will do justice to them. And, and we just see what happens and where they go uh, from there. Can you talk about the the two characters in this book? And did you find them in research? Did you make them up? What oh, the, the main characters? The main yeah. characters are totally made up. Yeah, the main characters are totally made up. Um, they are, you know, they may be inspired by um, people that I've run across in my research. Um, they represent, uh, Adam represents, you know, many of the people that, um, you know, didn't come back from Darien or did come back from Darien but came back damaged. Um, Lily represents some of the people out of my own family history that, um, you know, had a rough time, were in service and, and didn't have a lot of control over their own lives. Um, but they are, they move in among real life characters that I've grown very fond of. Um, some of them uh, are will be familiar to anybody that's read my books, The Winter Sea and 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 The Firebird, uh, because they belong to one particular family, the Murrays uh, of Abercarney, who are still a, a family that lives on the lands of Abercarney in Perthshire, and the Grahams of Inchbrakey, um, who now the family moved down to Devon in the uh, the seventeen hundreds, but the the descendants of both those families um, help me now with my research. They're wonderful, wonderful people. And um, I'm really honored to have been able to make their acquaintance in the present day and to have them helping me. And, and um, you know, it's, it's one thing that really warms my heart is the fact that I've read the letters of their ancestors and those two families were interwoven and intertwined and they used to walk across like their their lands are right beside each other the abercarney murrays now own the inch breaky lands where the grahams used to live and um so i've read the letters where you know these these people would have been just like 
you know, walking across and, and visiting with each other all the time. And they were in battle together. They were related. They intermarried. They looked after each other. Um, and 300 years later, I'm reading email chains. I'm in email chains between them where, like, you know, Alex Graham is saying, oh, I was up to Africarney the other day. And, you know, um, I was talking to Daniel and Anna. And, and, and it just kind of, I, I get this little catch in my heart that 300 years later, these same people are are still interacting with each other and visiting each other and, and, and that close with each other. And I just try to think of what their forebears would have thought of, of that, um, that reality. And, and it just, it just makes me feel, it gives me a feeling I can't even describe, but they've all been so kind. They've all been so wonderful. Have you ever, Have you ever in your research found, found out something out that, that, I don't know, didn't fit with what you were trying to write or, or maybe it was something that was a little, you know, not so flattering about, about a character that, uh, I mean, has reality ever intruded in a way that 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 gave you heartburn rather than a twinge? No, in your actually, no. Um, it's all been the other way. It's all been I've learned things that I've been like, oh my gosh, wow, I didn't know that. Um, I didn't. I have found out things about members of that family that. Um, that went beyond what I thought they actually did. Um, no. You know, and, and, you know, where, because they were so little written about, um, despite, like, I keep finding more and more evidence of how, wow. how intertwined they were in the, the politics and action of the day. Um, and for some reason, historians just didn't write about them. Uh, um, just uh, one quick question, then we should yeah. open it up to the audience. But, um, when you say you learn about them, I mean, if you went in my family back, I mean, there's nothing. There is nothing, nothing. Uh, what stuff? And how did they? Was it all related to churches? And and no, they they what, stuff how? is that family meticulously kept um, correspondence. Wow. And, uh, Captain Gordon kept uh, letters and a letter book. Captain Gordon went, went on to become an admiral in Peter the Great's Navy. Um, and all of this was preserved by the family. A lot of it was uh, is on loan to the uh, the National Records of Scotland. So you can go in and read it in the National Records mm -hmm. of Scotland. But people don't because it's just one little family, right? So, um, Well, it's and, also not uh, that easy to, to read an old letter. I mean, no, it's not. No, it's no, not. You I have mean, to just, really try hard. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, just even deciphering and, and the language and everything. But I it's, get to know their their handwriting. Right. So I know Robin's handwriting now. So I can tell I can I can tell if it's Robin right. writing or John or, or something. Wow. It's like, oh, that's so and so writing. And I can, you know, it, it's um, and there are people that I'm still looking. You know, I I've seen. I've seen Colonel Graham's signature, but I, I have yet to see an actual letter letter by Colonel Graham. And one of these days, one of these days, I'm going to find one and, and I'll be really happy. But um, one of these days, I'll find a portrait of him because I've never I've never looked him in the face. Um, but I have seen the others. And that's been. That's do you been keep, a do moment. You keep copies of them? I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's it's quite, it, it's quite moving really yeah. to, to be writing about these people, but it does also, it's also nice to be able to, you know, create the people to move around them as right, well. Right. Making them up. Yeah. That's what we do. So shall we? Yeah. Sure. Hello. Hello. So before we get into the crowd questions, Hallie, you've been so great to lead the conversation with us tonight. Yes. Can you tell everybody a little bit about careful what you wish for? Yes. So the opening line of careful what you wish for is Emily Harlow wasn't sure if her sock drawer sparked joy. <laughs> so it's a little bit of a tongue in cheek. She's a professional organizer married to a man who cannot pass a yard sale without stopping. And 
So that's a constant source of friction in their marriage, but not the most serious one. And uh, so my husband uh, was one of those guys who couldn't pass the yard sale without stopping. So his stuff inspired this book. No question about it. All of his stuff is in this book, but he's not the character in the book. The husband in this book, you wouldn't want to be married to him. He's, he's kind of a, a not so nice guy. Um, and so she has to decide if it's, if he can be folded or not, <laughs> or, or if he needs to just be <laughs> deep sick. So it's a mystery novel. Um, it's a, it's domestic suspense. Uh, and it's funny because, um, Susanna's book is, a, books are, a, this new book is really very much about, um, who can you trust and how can you tell? Exactly. And, and this book, that is the theme of this book, no question about it, for her, is uh, who who can she trust? And uh, But I wouldn't begin to try the multiple timelines or the multiple narrators. This is a pretty uh, focused. And it's one of those things where I hope readers will think, you know, this could happen to me, and shudder. <laughs> but it's 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 true, though. It's, it's the same theme it's the yeah. same like anyway it's the it's right. it's approaching the same theme just in a right. different mm -hmm. in a, a different canvas like a you know the the same the same theme painted on a different canvas it's really quite neat i'm i'm here and you're here <laughs> yeah but it's it's the same yeah you know yeah. it's it's so cool how how different writers approach right. the same topic you know so thank you for asking of course, of course. So we do have some crack questions. So the first one um, is from Jody. She wants to know how much time do you spend researching before you start writing? And I know Susanna, you talked a little bit about research, but so how much time before you actually do? You, how much time do you research before, before I start actually, writing? Yeah, I, it's I it's it depends on the book. Um, if I'm if I'm writing one book, I will be starting to research the next one um, because ideas keep coming out and those ideas are usually trying to drag me away from the book that I'm writing. I know. Do you find that, Hallie, do you have like the next book? Does it, does it try to lure you away from the one that you're writing? You no. know, when you're, no, <laughs> <laughs> I like how Hallie's like, no, no. <laughs> no. But, just, but see what happens with me is when I get in that middle that Hallie and I were talking about right. that when I get those doubts, the next yeah. one always comes out and says, Start me, start me. This is like, you know, so usually that's when those ideas start happening. And, and I can usually quiet that voice if I just start doing a bit of research for the mm -hmm. next one. So I'll start a, a file. I used to start a three ring binder. Um, and sometimes I still do. I have three ring binders back here somewhere. Um, sometimes I still do, but I start a file on the computer and I start reading and, and everything for the next book if I have an idea for it. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't, I'll just start doing a little bit. Um, I get into the writing of it pretty quickly because you don't know what you don't know till you get there. So as soon as those characters start moving for me, as soon as I get that first line, I start writing. And then I go as far as I can until I hit something I don't know, something I can't see, and then I'm doing the research for it. So the, the research is is a constant thing all along. Do you take a trip for each book? Yes. Yeah. Which is That's tricky. Tricky you know. now, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Well, now, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I always found that um, what you just said is really true. You don't know what you don't know, but you also don't know what you could use. Right. Until you travel. And because you're just, if you're just open to it, yep. and you're looking at the trees and the weather and the buildings and the you know, and and the and the person who guides you on a tour and knows something that you couldn't even imagine, Until you know, you all there. of that stuff. You know, you just have to, you know, tape record it, write it down. Even for my books, which are not um, labor intensive in terms of research, I would say, you know, the first six weeks are thinking, researching, yes. traveling. You know, uh, reading books doing whatever I need to do to be on solid ground for when I yep. start writing it. Well, it's kind of, if you look at it in a way, you're, you're filling the well, 
right? Yeah, like exactly. it, so that you can start drawing buckets out. And yeah. and then you write a little bit and, and then your bucket starts coming up dry and you have to fill yeah. it, you know, so it's, yes. but yeah. One of the things that, that I realized, I, I, I mean, I've been writing, I didn't start writing until I was 40, but the, the, uh, the thing that has surprised me so much about writing is I often don't know what I want to say until I have started writing it. Right. It, it's like the ideas, the points, even an essay, uh, the research and the sorting things. It's back to that theme crawling out of the novel, you know, right. the, the, you just it's it's not magic. No, but it, but it is some kind of alchemy, I think, you know, how 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 that happens. The process of actually writing will draw it out of you. Yeah, and, yeah. And, you and what just... you decide not to put in as much as what you decide to put in. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I agree. So one more research question. So Jody also wants to know, so if you're researching someone in history who was influential, but basically ignored by those who write history, and you said you kind of always look for like those stories that don't get told, where mm -hmm. how, where do you start doing the research if it's something that's maybe not as as well known? or those stories that get left out? Where do you start looking for those? You start looking for a story that's been left out? Um, I, I tend to stumble on the, on the, on them. I, you know, it's hard to look for a hole. <laughs> you fall into them. Yeah. Um, so it's, um, that's my best, my best way of saying it is you don't, you don't necessarily go looking for the hole, you, but yeah. you know it when you fall in it. Um, I found John Murray um, from the Winter Sea, for example, um, when I was reading a, a book called Playing the Scottish Card by John S. Gibson, um, that was all about the, the Franco-Jacobite invasion attempt of 1708. And he mentioned the, the main mover and shaker of the, the invasion attempt. And then he mentioned that Nathaniel Hook, who's the guy went north in the company of John Murray. And then about, you know, 50 pages later, he mentioned he came south in the company of John Murray. And that was it. That was all we got. And I'm like, who's, so, John, Murray? who's John Murray? That's interesting. So as I started looking for, you know, I looked in his bibli bibliography and started looking up John Murray and found that he was really fascinating and his life was really fascinating. And I wanted to find out more about him. So I just kept looking and looking and looking. And then I couldn't believe that, Nobody had really written about John Murray. So I thought, okay, I'll do it. And, um, you know, and then he became more interesting to me than all the other people that people had written about. So, um, you know, that, that's, that was the hole. I stepped in it and I thought, huh, you know, that's my hole. So that's, you look in the, when you step in something, you just look in the, the bibliography of the, the books that you're, you're reading and that will lead you to the primary sources that they used and then you just keep going back and back from there and it becomes this big game of you know google searching and, and it, it's 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 a whole where's waldo search that will just lead you down a rabbit warren of little things and you know but it's fun yeah much easier now than it would have been 30 years ago oh yeah the internet oh, yeah. i mean seriously yeah 30 years ago you would have had to be over there you know like trust me like when i when i was researching even when i was researching for the winter sea it was a lot of over there as right. opposed to just doing it online yeah. right so i have a, a a quick disclaimer for my next question it's for both of you but you're not allowed to say each other's books because we've established that you've read each other uh -huh. and you're fans of each other what is something that you've read lately that you've enjoyed How about you, Susanna? While Holly is getting her visual oh, aid, actually, I can't. I can't. I can. Um, I I have to unplug so I can. Okay. Read it. <laughs> yeah, I've been reading William Kent Kruger, who's got a book that's out right now, and then I read his earlier book. I I, I kind of went on a little binge. Mm -hmm. uh, because um, I like his books. They're uh, they're 
thoughtful yeah. and setting rich and and they always have relationship between a man and his son and i always enjoy that piece of the books as well yeah he's just a, a really good writer so i just dropped a link to lightning strike in the comments if anybody's interested in it we do still have a handful of signed copies i think left we did a really great event with kent um a couple of weeks ago uh, about the book he was in uh, conversation with uh david hesco wombly wyden who wrote winter counts and it was a fantastic chat hearing the two of them so that's also up on the youtube channel if anybody wants to hear that and how about you susanna the dawn hounds by sasha stronach have you ever read this johnny mm -mm. okay that all right great it is cool. So The Dawn Hounds by Sasha Stronach. And the best way to tell you about The Dawn Hounds by Sasha Stronach, who is, a, I believe, a, they're a New Zealand-based fantasy writer. This was an award-winning book. Um, okay. A ship rolls through the fog. Its doomed crew fallen victim to an engineered plague. Yat Lin Hook, disgraced cop, former thief, long lost love to a flame-haired street girl, stumbles across its deadly trail, but powerful men will do anything to keep it secret. They kill Yat, it doesn't stick. An ancient intelligence reanimates her and sends her out to enact its monstrous designs. She has her own plans to find her lost love and solve her own murder before the plague tears the city to pieces. And it goes on from there. Whoa. So I really, really, really like this book. And it's written in direct... Um, refutation of all the books in which um gay characters are created and killed uh -huh. <laughs> and it's so it's awesome because it's it's just you have to read it it's i really like this book so, so. <laughs> so. It's, it's it's just awesome and and sasha stronach is, is also a very good follow on twitter by the way so um i will recommend that as well but this is an awesome book you would you would love this book very cool all right. I, read, I read a lot of fantasy and fantasy mm -hmm. with mystery is like totally my cat now. So. Yes. Um, so <laughs> I'm being joined by Juliet. <laughs> um, so uh, last question before we head out this evening, I know Susanna, I know you just had a book come out like two days ago, but what are you working on now? I am working on uh, yet another book having to do with the Murray family, because I just came up with them, uh, the Murrays and the Grahams. Um, but in this case, I'm taking them back, because I'm not ready to be finished with them yet. So I'm taking them back to 1612 and dealing with the court of King James the I and VI, um, Mary Queen of Scots' son. And uh, yeah, so just uh, one of the Murrays was um, intimately entwined in that court so i'm i'm writing another sort of historical mystery type thing there it's a road trip people are on horseback it's all kind of fun so right now I've, people are talking about research right now i'm researching all the um the old post roads that used to used to be there and the kinds of horses that people used to ride and the extinct breeds of horses that are there and all kinds of stuff so that's what i'm up to now ali what are you writing I am working on a novel. Uh, I'd like to write um, generations of women in the same story, uh, either related to each other or neighbors, or I, I really like playing with different p characters, frames of reference and how different mm -hmm. they are 20 years apart or 30 years apart. Um, so I've got a, a threesome, a, an elderly woman, her daughter and her daughter's daughter in brooklyn living in a brownstone cool with the old lady on the top floor and uh i i i'm playing with a lot of things that uh, you know i find uh, when you're a writer even the stuff that you write that never turns into something mm -hmm. it's like zombies you know they, they it can reanimate yep and uh and come back and not bite you but you know nourish you uh, so I'm working with uh, uh, stuff from, well, it's a complicated book. Um, I I we'll, see if, we'll see how far I get with it. <laughs> I can't wait. I really, really am looking forward to that. I love stuff. I, I want to say something because I know, Johnny, you're going to wrap no. stuff up. But I do want to speak directly with everybody that's, that's watching and, and do a little 
bookstore pitch for you. Because, um, well, you know that my mom used to own an uh, independent mm -hmm. bookstore when I was little. And I feel very strongly about this. Um, the, the hardback book that Johnny was showing you at the beginning of the, the thing is only for independent bookstores. You will not find it anywhere else. Um, our publisher was, we don't give it to anybody other than independent bookstores. So you can't get it anywhere. Um, I hand signed all those, uh, and it's a limited, it's a very limited edition. So, um, uh, if you want to give one to somebody for Christmas, if you want to get one for yourself, um, please think of ordering it from, from Murdered by the Books. Um, it's, bookstores have had a really hard time in the pandemic and, uh, they have always had my back. Um, this bookstore in particular has had my back since I started touring and I've been touring for a while. Um, and even though I know some of you will have bought your book already, or you may have, you know, pre-ordered a book somewhere else and you're thinking, oh, I already have my copy of Susanna's book. That's fine. Um, you know, buy someone else's book from Johnny or buy Hallie's book from Johnny or, um, you know, just, just give them a little bit of love to, to pay them back for the love they've given me. Um, it's, uh, it's just a small thing to do. Um, I remember from the days when my mom was running the bookstore, it's, it's not an easy thing to do. And nobody does anything in the world of books for anything other than the love of books. So anytime we can spread that love around, it really means a lot. So thank you very much for, for, uh, you know, coming out and supporting. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. And as she mentioned, we do have signed copies. We've got signed book plates to go with them as well. Mm -hmm. uh, if you are local, she's left enough room for the, on the book plates. The next time she comes through, she can personalize them for you. Uh, if you are not local, we ship um, all over the country. If you're interested in um, international shipping, shoot us an email and we can help you out with that. Um, like she said, just not with only her book. We've got a signed book page on the website. If you're not doing um, books right now, we've got tons of jigsaw puzzles. Um, lots of stuff out there. So I, I appreciate that, Susanna. Thank you so much. Um, so to recap for anybody who might have joined us late, we have been chatting with Susanna Kearsley, whose book, The Vanished Days, just came out on Tuesday. As she mentioned, we've got um, Indie Books for exclusive signed hardcovers that are signed on the um, back of the dust jacket with the map. Um, and like I said, we're happy to ship those anywhere. We've also been chatting with uh, Hallie Efron, whose book, Careful What You Wish For, came out in paperback in August. We've got copies of both of them in store. If you missed any part of our chat, once we are done chatting, uh, Facebook and YouTube will archive them, so you'll be able to rewatch them there. If you want to see uh, Susanna's talk about the Deadly Hours last year, that's up as well, as, long, as well as uh, literally hundreds of author events that we've done in the last almost two years. Uh, so there's a great wealth of stuff. Uh, whether it's uh, you want more domestic suspense like Hallie writes, historical, there's any subgenre of mystery and some fantasy stuff out there as well to check out, which we hope that you guys will do. Susanna, as always, it was so wonderful to get to chat with you for a little bit. And Hallie, it was really great to meet you virtually. Thank you so much for doing this with us this evening. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, have a good night.